recording's on. Excellent. Hello, everybody. My name is Amy Tan, and I work for Houston Community College, where I am the Dean for English and Communications. I also serve as the co-chair of our OER and Z Degree Steering Committee. Um, I'm here with my co-chair, Akanksha Bhatnagar. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Akanksha, like Amy said. Uh, I'm a political science and sociology student at the University of Alberta, uh, all the way up in Edmonton, Canada. Um, and I'm also used to be the president and the vice president academic of our student government up there. Um, and there I founded our student or sorry, our uh, university uh, open education steering committee. So I was able to really work on connecting students, staff and faculty together. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here on the call today. We'd like to welcome you all to the Open Ed Steering Committee community call. Um, here is uh, the list of our Open Ed Conference Steering Committee members. Many of them are joining us today on the call, um, some as panelists, and we, we want you to know who's here. Um, we ask that when you speak for the first time that you take a minute to introduce yourself to, to everyone on the phone call today. And today we're going to be using Mentimeter to, um, to be able to get feedback and responses from you today, just like we did at our last conference call. So if you wanna take a moment to queue up your device, whether it's your, your computer browser or your phone or a tablet. We really recommend that you use a separate device to join us on Minty um, and then, then view the Zoom conference call on a different advice, the device. This really helps uh, with managing. You can see, you can see the, the presentation and join in on Menti. We have a QR code set up for you if that's easier. Um, also, you can navigate to menti.com and be sure to enter the code 486339. Um, we also have the chat set up for you. If you navigate to the chat, there's a direct link to Minty. And I also want to um, encourage you to use the chat to ask questions. We will be answering questions as we are going along, and we will also leave some time at the end for questions and answers. Excellent. So I think we're ready to get started with a few icebreaker questions to get us going. And so we just want to hear from you. How are you feeling today? How is everybody out there in cyberspace feeling? Okay, so, so a couple of you are hanging in there. At least one person is a little out of it, I see. I, I'm gonna join in with those who are really glad it's Friday. Oh, and some, it's, it looks like there's a big group who's doing good. So keep doing good. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> okay. We'll move to our next question. And so just to get an idea of who's joining us, um, where are you joining us from? Please enter your US state, Canadian province, or country. And I know we know we have at least one person from Canada. <laughs> I know we have more than one person from Canada. I see California, Georgia is looking big and bold there on our word cloud, Colorado. California. Let's see. Uh, somebody from Hawaii is here. Excellent. So it's wonderful to have all of you with us. And we have one more question. We'd like to know, how would you describe your role in the community? So I'll give you a chance to respond, just to give us an idea of who's joining us today. Looks like we have a lot of librarians. I always tell my students the librarian is your best friend. We're really happy to have you here. We're happy to have all of you here. Wonderful, okay. Well, I'm gonna turn the meeting over at this point to Daniel Williamson.
Hey everybody, uh, it's great to be with you on the Friday before Memorial Day for all of you who are in the US. Hope you're looking forward to a long weekend. Um, so I'm going to give a quick update on progress with regard to uh, planning the conference uh, and specifically around uh, the venue. Um, so we were able to secure a venue in Denver at the Hyatt Regency Denver Colorado Conference Center um, for the week of November 9th. Um, this all took place way before um, COVID was a, a thing, and we recognize that the resulting economic downturn has placed enormous pressure on colleges, universities, and schools around the country, and that this might make it difficult for many in our community to secure the funds for travel if we are permitted to travel come November. Um, so right now, um, after talking with the hotel um, and understanding what flexibility they can give us, we are planning for this to be a hybrid event with both an in-person and online platform. Um, so we're really excited that this is a first opportunity to, to really make this a successful hybrid event, um, a big change from what it's been in the past. Um, the hotel has given us some flexibility. And so the financial impact of hosting a hybrid event should be minimal. Um, additionally, we are working with the venue to provide information about ways to ensure flexibility in any potential travel plans. We will also continue to monitor the needs of our community uh, through surveys uh, and conversations like this one. Uh, and as we get closer to that November 9th um, date, the date of the conference, all of this information from you all will help us uh, make decisions about how to proceed in terms of either reducing space or making alternative arrangements. And of course, we're constantly monitoring um, the guidance from the governments, uh, both at, in Colorado um, and federally. Um, and so I wanna ensure you that regardless of which route we end up um, going, um, we will work to make this an amazing event. Uh, hopefully we can figure out some way to incorporate karaoke into both the remote and in-person uh, venues, because you all know I love karaoke. Um, and I remain optimistic that we'll be able to really host a great hybrid in-person online event. Nonetheless, you know, this is a time in history where more than ever, our society needs an open, robust, and more equitable education system. And I truly believe that the open ed community is uniquely positioned to usher in the solutions to the problems we're facing today. So I'm sure regardless of whether we uh, are meeting in person or online or hybrid, uh, we will have a lot to share come November. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Spencer. Uh, Spencer is uh, our, our lead for the on the ground team um, in Colorado. Uh, so take it away, Spencer. Thanks, Daniel. Yep. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, we're keeping a close eye on what's going on here in Colorado. Um, fortunately, my employer is the state of Colorado, so I am receiving those updates on a very regular basis, staying in close contact with Daniel um, about kind of operational directions um, and things of that nature. But we are super excited to support with Open Ed 20 um, and obviously moving forward beyond into 2021. Um, our governor is a huge champion of open education, and so I'm really excited to kind of showcase this community to our governor and, and vice versa. You know, having a big advocate in our state government for open education um, is, is really something that we want to take advantage of here in Colorado. So we're happy to welcome you all virtually. Um, we're happy to welcome you all to Denver, um, which is gorgeous in the fall. And um, with that, I, you know, I'm also open to, to any questions or anything that you all um, have on your minds with regard to what's going on in Colorado. So, you know, as Daniel mentioned, we're, we're open to, to um, the questions you might have. So um, with that, I will pass it to either MJ or Nicole. So MJ, are you on? Uh, don't believe um, she's here, but but sh uh, this is Nicole Allen from Spark. Um, she just asked me to to give a quick update on where things stand on the um, the the process for 2021. Um, so part of what uh, our four organizations decided um, uh, we would make sure to do is um, in supporting the conference for the next two years, start looking for a 2021 venue very early in the process to make sure that, you know, we're getting a good deal and, and have that lined up for the future and don't need to worry about it. Um, you know, obviously right now with the conditions uh, with COVID and, 
and just the level of uncertainty, it seems premature to uh, be, be really moving forward with that right now. So that's on pause for the moment. The plan is to look in the Washington DC metro area and as, as soon as there's a, just a little bit more clarity and certainty about, about what um, 2021 is likely to start looking like, we'll proceed with that process. Um, so, uh, so yeah, um, I will pass it uh, on to Ethan Senak to provide an update on, on where things stand with the um, uh, conference planning teams and, and volunteers. Ethan? Awesome. <clears throat> Thanks, Nicole. Um, hey, everybody. This is Ethan. I work with ISCME, um, which uh, many of you may know through OER are Commons. I'm, I'm based in DC. Um, and just really quickly, uh, an update on the planning teams. Uh, as, as most of you hopefully saw, we sent out a call for participation a few weeks ago um, describing the different planning teams for the conference. Um, notably, those included the, the program committee, our online conference committee, the future of open ed, uh, and sorry, team, by the way, I mean program team, online conference team, future of open ed team, and our diversity, equity, and inclusion team. Um, we asked members of the community to identify which of those teams they're interested in working on and where they have relevant experience. Um, so I'm excited to be able to say over 120 people responded to that. So um, thank you all so much. And that's just such an amazing indicator of the dedication and, and passion in this community. So um, we're really excited uh, to, to have that amount of participation from the community. Um, that forum will stay open for volunteer signups. Um, we'll need uh, a whole bunch of help to, to make the conference uh, go uh, smoothly and, and effectively. So um, you can feel free to add your name if you haven't already to, to volunteer uh, at any time. Um, now, of course, we have the challenging task uh, of figuring out how to get the maximum number of people into the teams that they are most interested in and the ones that their experience is most geared towards um, while keeping the teams a manageable size. So our goal is to do that by the end of next week and we're hoping to be able to start notifying folks um, on that on that timeline. Um, we have a few questions right now that we're hoping to, to ask for input on from, from the community regarding these teams. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Akeksha to, to run through those questions and uh, jump back in the Mentimeter now. Awesome. So if you're not on Mentimeter yet, you just have to go to uh, menti.com and use the code that's right on the top of the slides here, 486339. Um, and we just really want to know what are some values that you think that volunteers should bring to the planning process. And so uh, we have a little word cloud that'll pop up as soon as you are uh, putting in a couple of words. So we have knowledge, flexibility, experience, I like that, innovation, inclusivity, um, see that a few times. Flexibility is a big one, which I honestly think is a great value to have, especially going into planning a conference during a global pandemic. I don't know about other folks. This is definitely my first time uh, doing that. So awesome. Ability to execute. Experience. Inclusivity seems to be a large one there, which is, is awesome. We're going to talk about that a bit later. Collaboration. Uh, I love the word clouds because I think it's really able to show uh, what everybody is saying and it's really putting everything together. This looks awesome, folks. Also great spelling. I feel like I'm not a great speller, so no one seems to have made big mistakes here. Enthusiasm. Cool. Um, so the Mentimeter slides are gonna be are gonna be open for a few days, I believe until Tuesday, as was mentioned. So we'll move on quickly to the next question, um, which is sort of asking, how do you feel about potential sponsors organizations, foundations, and what role they should play in the planning process, or should they be on the planning teams? What does that look like? We have a couple of answers here. Some of them said uh, a consultation basis makes the most sense. We should limit the number of sponsor presentations, um, specific types of roles or memberships for various organizations. I don't know if anybody from the planning committee wants to um, say anything about this, people who've had experience with this before. 
Hi, yes, Akasha, this is Vera Kennedy. I'm a faculty member at West Hills College of and Fresno State, where I also serve as the OER fellow. And when we developed this question, we really wanted um, everyone to think about um, the idea that we want to support everyone to contribute and participate in the conference. What we're asking you to do is to consider the role or level of involvement you feel like sponsors and organizations should be involved in conference planning and leadership. So thinking about their involvement, how involved do you want them in program development and the delivery of the conference, whether it be on ground, uh, online, um, attendance, just different things related to conference planning. Um, how do you feel about their involvement? What role do you see them being able to take a part in? Thank you much. Awesome. So we're seeing a lot of these answers roll in, talking about transparency. This is really awesome. Super helpful as well. It's almost hard to see all of them right now, but you're able to uh, receive them on the back end as well. Awesome. So I'll pass it over to Amy just to go into a couple of, of uh, business style questions to help us get a little bit of a better understanding as to how we can continue to move forward. Hey, thank you, Akanksha. So we're just trying to um, think about how to move forward with flexibility um, and innovation. And we just would like to know from you, assuming that public health conditions allow, how do you plan to attend Open Ed 20 on November 9th through the 11th? Will you plan to attend in person? Will you plan to attend online? Are you still unsure? So again, just a reminder, we really appreciate your responses and your feedback. It really helps in the planning. And um, I see there's still a lot of uncertainty out there. I know this is something we're all managing is the uncertainty, but we will definitely keep your responses in mind. And again, if, if, you, if you know people who were not able to join the call, I hope you'll encourage them to click on the, the Mentimeter presentation when the link gets it around so that, that they can contribute their responses. Okay, wonderful, we'll move to the next question. Assuming public health conditions allow, give your best guess on the following statements regarding attending Open Ed 20 in person on November 9th through 11th in Denver. Do you expect to have funding for travel? Do you expect that your employer or the government will allow travel in November? Um, would you be willing to travel personally in order to be in person at the conference? Um, please note that on the left-hand side is very unlikely. On the right-hand side is very likely. You can see the results popping up there. It looks like there's still quite a bit of um, uncertainty right down the middle there. <laughs> okay. Well, again, thank you so much for sharing this information with us. We'll move on to the next slide. If applicable, in-person registration in past years has been approximately 400 US dollars with early bird registration. For in-person registration at Open Ed 20, what amount would be ideal for you? What is the maximum amount you would pay? What amount do you think would be fair? On the left-hand side, we have the minimum of zero US dollars. And on the right-hand side, we have set a maximum higher price at $800, 800 US dollars. So again, we really appreciate this information. Um, Daniel, would you wanna speak? Yeah. Yeah, so, so one thing that I think is really important in the reimagining of the Open Ed Conference is that it's really meant to be community driven. Um, and so transparency in your abilities to pay and support operations of this event is, is really important and will help guide our work. Um, and additionally, we intend to use this information to help determine the most appropriate cost for registration, uh, recognizing that it does cost something uh, and so we also intend to be transparent in the, this process, and we will share the models we're using to determine pricing um, 
as the the as the, that becomes more concrete. So thank you so much for your input. This is really really helpful. Also, I just want to note in the chat that Phil Edwards has asked is is sliding scale an option for registration fees, and I think that's something that the the planning committee can discuss. So, okay, thank you again, and we'll move to our next question. There are real costs to holding an online conference that will need to be covered by registration. For online registration at Open Ed 20, what amount would be ideal for you? What is the maximum amount you would pay? What amount do you think would be fair? Again, this is considering if you were attending solely online, what would you expect to pay? With the understanding that there would be significantly reduced costs in an online um, environment, however, there, there would still be some costs incurred. So excellent. Again, really appreciate your response and your feedback on these questions. And I believe I will, at this point, turn it back over to Akanksha. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, thanks, Amy, for passing it over. So uh, it was really awesome to see in that word cloud uh, about some values that we want to see in the, on the planning teams. Uh, one of those words that came up was inclusivity. And so we wanted to uh, spend some time today talking about that with you folks. And so we know that this, we want to make this conference something that really embodies the values that we have as a community. And so our conversation today is obviously not going to be exhaustive. Uh, we don't, I don't think, have enough time to really get into uh, the deep conversations around it. But we did want to just start that conversation and just note to everybody that this is an ongoing conversation that the committee would love to have with the community. Um, in any shape, way, or form, whether it's right now, whether it's um, a little bit later on another call, or whether it's just via email. Um, and so we have a couple questions here that we wanted to um, talk about. Last month's meeting, um, again, inclusion was another one of the central values that people shared. And so the first question that we really want to ask you is, what does inclusivity at a conference mean to you? Um, I know folks have gone to conferences before, so maybe providing some of those thoughts or folks who haven't, maybe what you think would be the best. And I would say for this question, keep in mind maybe um, that COVID is not a thing. Just generally, what do you think inclusivity could look like? I'll also pass it over to Jasmine to just give a little bit of, of thoughts and feedback on this as well while you folks are thinking to help you uh, come forward with your thoughts as well. Jasmine? Yeah, thanks, Akinsha. Um, So I guess when I'm thinking about inclusion more broadly, for me, inclusion involves, you know, inviting everyone to sit at the table, both figuratively and literally. Um, of course, those individuals being heard and working toward a common goal that benefits, you know, a wide variety of folks. It also involves um, centering the work, or I'm sorry, the, the work of centering marginalized people in the process of accepting their contributions as well, or contributions from diverse groups. And I will say by diverse, I'm not referring to the term that I see many people use when they're actually referring to people of color. I'm seeing that a lot when people say diverse people, they really mean people of color. And I personally don't like it when people do this because of course white people can have diverse experiences outside of the realm of race. We shouldn't be just talking about racial or ethnic diversity and inclusion, although of course that's, that's certainly important. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Um, I'm talking about a broader term that really refers to those whose experiences are not always at the forefront of these conversations, like, for example, people with disabilities or trans individuals or those coming from the global south. Um, it, it's, it's really not enough to um, tell a, di a diverse um, ecosystem, if you will, um, when there's a failure to create an inclusive environment where people can thrive, fully participate, and bring their whole self to you know, this gathering. Um, on the same token, I think it's okay, right, to grant space or hold space for, of course, holding organizations and gatherings like this accountable for creating an inclusive environment, but also acknowledging that this process is it's not going to be perfect. I mean, we can certainly be gracious toward each other without making excuses for historically privileged groups. 
Um, I, I personally think this helps to take a little bit of pressure off of needing this to be perfect. And like Akanksha was saying earlier, this is not going to be the first or our last time, excuse me, that we're going to be talking about this process of inclusivity. Um, but it does need to be something that we are proud of and of course disrupts uh, previous models that we've seen. So all in all, this is really hard work. I mean, someone unfortunately will be left out to a certain degree, and of course that's not intentionally, because of the very system that we, we work in at least in the North American Western context. So uh, we're working in a broader context that makes our work to be more inclusive, a lot more difficult. And since we are asking for an inclusive environment, we need to make sure we are actually ready for that. And what I mean is if you belong to a historically privileged group, it may feel uncomfortable seeing that your experience is not centered because you're used to it, whether you acknowledge this. So let's make sure that we are actually ready to do this labor together. And then just last thing, because I feel like I'm just talking so much, um, in this pursuit of inclusion, uh, of course, privileges are going to be addressed. And so I actually recently tweeted this, when someone points out your privilege or the privilege of a group that you belong to, instead of getting defensive, thank them for using their energy and emotional labor to educate and make you a more um, well-informed person. So that's about all I have to say for, for that. And I'm looking here at the word cloud and it's just really amazing to see all the different words and phrases that are coming up here. So thank you. Yeah, thanks Jasmine for that. That's uh, super helpful. So we'll move on to the next question here. Uh, allows for um, more, for people to put in a lot more words if you're interested. So we're really asking, what are some challenges and barriers that we might face uh, in the community in terms of creating inclusivity? And I'll pass it over to Vera if she has any thoughts about this. Thank you. Yes. So in developing this question, we really wanted everyone to focus on who is often left out. Uh, we want you to deep, go deep into your experiences and think about how you've been reached and maybe some acknowledgement of understanding those who have not. And that might even be you. You might be someone who had not had access in one way or another to a particular event or within a program. So we really wanted to know about those challenges that you have witnessed yourself or others face, not just around accessibility, but particularly around culture, maybe economics, region. So please bring forth your ideas, things that you can acknowledge that you've seen, understood, or felt from your participation in events like this. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, so we're seeing a lot of really, really awesome comments here. Sometimes it can be hard to break into the established groups. I definitely feel that comment as a, as a student leader. It, it was really, uh, at first, really nerve wracking to me to, to get involved um, with open, but it was a lot, it was really easy once I uh, pushed myself a little bit. This is great. Kingsha, I'm also seeing, this is Amy, I'm also seeing that, um, you know, we may not hear from those who are left out. And I think this is something that the steering committee has discussed and, and is something that, that keeps some of us up at night. So um, anything, any advice or feedback on that, uh, we, we'd really, really, really love to hear from you. Yeah, that's a great point, Amy. I think budget and funding challenges for those in marginalized groups is always is pretty difficult as well. Awesome. These are so helpful. I'm just reading them as they're going so quickly. This is great. This is um, again, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, I'm, I'm seeing that online accessibility is um, coming up a lot. And that is something that we have discussed on the steering committee in terms of making sure that we're not exasperating pre-existing barriers to you know on, online accessibility and so we we definitely welcome comments as to how we can limit or at least ease some of those barriers yeah i think that's a great point to know and we'll uh maybe move on to the next question because i think that a lot of the f things that you folks are saying here might be uh able for us to have a conversation about in the next question but 
we're really looking for, as we know, uh, there's the possibility of doing a hybrid model, an in-person conference and an online conference. So this is a two-pronged question where the first question is just really um, asking about what are the practical ways that we can add inclusivity in an in-person conference. So whether that is making sure that there's available mics for presenters and for people asking questions, uh, whether there's the ability to you know, group all the same style of people or style of uh, sessions in the same area of the conference setting. Um, so what are your folks' thoughts on this? And I think if anyone from the committee wants to jump in and really provide some feedback or respond to some of the comments, this is gonna be super helpful. And just to keep in mind that the next question is gonna be talking about what does inclusivity look like uh, in an online setting, which I think is gonna be a, a doozy for a couple of us. I really like the comment about a thoughtful and enforced uh, code of conduct. I'm curious what people's thoughts might be on the best ways for us to enforce the code of conduct rather than just, because uh, my experience with it is that people will often just say, remember that there's a code of conduct, uh, make sure that you're reading it. What are some other ways that we can make the code of conduct sort of top of mind for people so that um, it is something that we are thinking about actively? Awesome. This is Sarah. I see a couple of really good ones to point out too. The use of pronoun stickers on name tags. Uh, also caught my attention was having the live captions, which is also something that I think a lot of us have been introduced to now that we have gone 100% to teach online uh, rather than having to wait for a recording. So that was really good feedback. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much, Vera. I like the practical ones of making sure that there's gender neutral bathrooms, that there's quiet spaces. Spaces to decompress, I find, are, are really important, especially when you're constantly having to, to walk around and think during a conference. It's really nice to have a space where you can um, just decompress and, and just hang out for a bit. A little bit biased, but I also like the, the student-centered panels for students. I think that's a really great comment as well. Awesome. I'm just gonna give an um, enthusiastic thumbs up to the use mics and force the use of mics. And I see another one, everyone using their microphone. This is Jasmine again, and I saw here no keynotes. And I think we discussed that in our last community call in terms of how that implicitly, of course, creates this hierarchy um, within this community. And I'm, I'm at least feeling, and I don't wanna speak on behalf of the community, but my interpretation is that um, many of us don't want that hierarchy. We want more of a grassroots gathering where we're all sharing, collaborating, and, and you know, of course sharing best practices. So I just wanna bring that to everyone's attention. That seems like that is definitely something that um, folks don't want, <laughs> no keynotes. Jasmine, I'm gonna piggyback off of the comment I saw on the previous slide. Somebody had posted no more OER rock stars. And mm, I, yeah. I think that falls into that frame that we traditionally, when you're talking about OER, we always see the same people, the same names leading, you know, kind of talking at giving information rather than it being more participation, engaging process. So Absolutely. I wanted to add my comments to yours. And someone said they like keynotes. So that's, that's good. <laughs> and these are great converse, like conversations for us to be able to ponder as uh, the people are on the planning teams as well, hopefully, and on the committee as a whole. 
So we'll move to the next, um, the next question, which I think will also be really interesting. And maybe we can spend some time uh, discussing some of the answers here. But what does inclusivity look like for an online conference? And I don't know about other folks in the room, but um, since having moved everything online, uh, it's definitely taken a strain on just being able to focus for a solid eight hours a day. Um, I'm noticing that my eyes are hurting more, which if you don't have a blue light filter on your laptop, you should absolutely uh, invest in something like that. It's, it's very helpful. But how can we make sure that inclusivity is top of mind, even though we're doing things online where technology might actually not be super helpful for us and we're providing things like meals or providing intentional space might be a little bit awkward if we're not using uh, video. We don't have that face-to-face -face interaction. Captioning for presentation seems to be, yeah, really interesting. A great point was made about uh, making sure that presentations are available during all time zones. Um, that's really, really cool because I think there, we, this, confer this conference to be international really has to, has to take that into account. So that's a really great comment. Toxic social platforms is not required to converse. I feel like that's talking about Twitter, which is not wrong all the time. I like that as well. This is just out of curiosity. Do um, people have, like, has anyone ever tried to do online uh, live captions using like Zoom or any other kind of um, online thing? And if so, like, what did it look like? Did it work for you? Jennifer, I see that you have used it. R Richard as well. Okay, cool. Yeah, I yeah. use it. This is Vera. I use it on both in Google Slides and PowerPoint. They both have captioning services. It's just you have to display them uh, through the web uh, based software. And um, Google is more accurate on words, but uh, Microsoft is more accurate in adding punctuation. So it, there's good and bad. You know, it's not always uh, come out perfectly clear. Uh, but it is it is a lot more helpful than not having a resource. But then there are captioning tools for just doing uh, presentations like this. So awesome! I'm seeing record sessions. The the committee has absolutely talked about how we can uh, record sessions so people can come back and visit them at a different time, which is kind of a benefit I think of doing them. Uh, doing some of these sessions in an online session is that had this been an in person only, uh, there might have been less of a chance for you to go to two sessions. I know I often am like, I want to go to both sessions at once and I'll send a friend to one of them and then try to take their notes after. So it might be great for us to be able to record things so we're able to uh, really look at them later. Oh, yeah, definitely taking into account people who don't have access to good internet all the time. Um, that's a really great point, Justin. Providing a, cro a talking stick. I am curious to know how that works in, in Zoom. I feel like if you have like a bunch of people, how are you able to sort of like navigate who talks first? I've had people use like the little function of raising your hand um, in the little chat box. I don't know if there's uh, more fun ways to do that. This is Amy. I also appreciate the multiple breaks. I think that there that when you when you move online, there's a, a tendency to think that you just have endless time and you can just run things, you know, back to back to back and people can take breaks when they want to, but but then you end up missing things. And I, I think it's really important to to schedule that break time and, and to give people a chance to pause. I don't know if anybody else from the uh, panelist uh, group wants to add any comments about what they have experienced or how they've you know felt challenges in creating inclusivity in an online space and maybe getting some people to ponder those thoughts. 
Akingsha, this is Nicole. I, I just wanted to jump in and um, acknowledge the the tensions that sometimes come up around some of the issues that are that are being raised about you know wanting to make sure that the conference is affordable and that being important to make it accessible to people. Um, but you know things like providing uh, live interpretation uh, or certain types of, of recording and live streams and web platforms uh, have costs. And I think one of the things that, that you know, I'm most looking forward to in the process of planning this conference is really grappling with those questions. Um, and, it, and it's just so, it's, it, it means so much to see all of these really important um, just pieces of feedback and ideas. And I think it, it, it's going to be a lot of hard work to come up with the right balance, but I'm really excited to work with, you know, fellow steering committee members and the community to, to come up with the right balance and make sure that we're taking all of this into consideration and, and really deliberating where, where to invest uh, the, the funding that, that we have <laughs> and be able to maximize inclusivity in a way that's meaningful for the community. Yeah, that's a good point, Nicole. There's a comment here on peer review with meaningful feedback. Oh no, it just went away. But it was talking about uh, peer reviewing people's presentations, which um, is an interesting concept for sure to make sure that they kind of fit um, this I think you know something that I am thinking about now just talking out loud a bit is like maybe there's a way for us to include um, more of these online values regarding uh, online conferences in the code of conduct and you know making sure that presenters know to you know run through how they want questions to be answered and stuff so I think this is really helpful in terms of providing us with some really practical things we can do Great. So again, this is not the only time that we want to have this conversation. We want this to be um, really dynamic and be able to talk about this all the time. So if you have ideas later, again, the Menti uh, slides are going to be open until Tuesday. But if you have ideas past there, feel free to shoot any of us um, on the planning committee a, a message or an email. Uh, we're happy to bring it up. Um, we want to make sure that these things that we're learning from it, but also we're able to really do our best in terms of trying to integrate as much as we can, knowing that uh, because we're having to, to move online potentially and do a hybrid model that it might be uh, learning on a lot of people's parts here. But we really appreciate all the comments and um, people chatting in the box about things that we can do in little resources that they can pass on to us. Uh, we're gonna move on to sort of the the housekeeping questions. So how can we find another way for us to meet again? Uh, what days work best for you and such? So I'll pass it over to Amy again to just lead us through the end of the call. Okay, thank you, Akingsha. So we'll, we just have a few housekeeping questions. Um, so we're thinking in terms of scheduling the next community meeting on the typical week, which days work best for you? So just let us know if Fridays work for you, is this a good time or would you prefer a different day? You can see on the left, it's worse for me. On the right, it's better for me. And I think the results are hidden. There we go. So it looks like, looks like Fridays are pretty good for most people, but we definitely want to hear from you so that we know we're scheduling calls to include the most people. Um, and so we may have some variety there. We'll, we'll review the results and uh, see what we can do for our next meeting. Scheduling the next community meeting on the typical weekday, which time slots work best for you? You can see we um, took some time to designate the time zones there to try to, to help you, you determine what, what works for you, what's worse for you, and what's better for you. So I'll give you just a minute to record those answers. And we will definitely take these responses into consideration when we're scheduling our next call. Wonderful, okay, I think, I, I think that might be our last question. 
Oh, we have one more question, which is an open ended question. What other ideas or feedback would you like to share for the open ed conference. So we really hope you'll take this opportunity to share your best ideas with us. All of your ideas are welcome. Um, we're, we want to we want to see want to see your thoughts and ideas. And um, again, don't forget if you if you want to come back and add some more responses or if you know someone who couldn't make the call today, please tag them and ask them to um, click on the link and and fill out the the responses so that so that we have we have the feedback to consider as we're moving forward. Okay, so wonderful. We appreciate the thank yous. We appreciate your time and being here. Um, I do think we have about 15 minutes for any additional questions and answers. And I think that we're going to have, um, I think Akanksha is going to manage that from the chat. We've had a few as we've been going along and I think we got those answered. So if you have a moment to review the chat, if there's any further questions and answers, I'm sorry, any further questions, this is a time to go ahead and put those in the chat. Okay, and while you're thinking of questions, um, just looking through some of the responses here. Um, let's see, looks like there's a vote for lightning talks. Um, an organizational platform that can help us share more fluidly. Um, a suggestion to have different tracks according to institutions. I mean, just to jump in quickly, somebody uh, made a quick comment about how it's going to be really hard maybe to create that sense of community, knowing that there might be some people who are more able financially um, or in other situations be able to make it to the conference in person, uh, leaving out a lot of people who might want to be part of the community. So I think that's a really, like, really good point to note that a hybrid might be good in terms of getting that content, but a big thing that we love about the, the conference is that we're able to develop a community out of it and that might be a little bit more difficult to to create in an online or hybrid model so that's a really great comment and something that the the committee will have to to ponder uh, or think about a little absolutely well i'm seeing no questions in the in the chat that i think that we haven't um answered i think everyone's comments and questions have been super helpful I also know that it's the long weekend for folks in America. Uh, we were joking earlier when we were prepping that Canada just had their long weekend um, a couple weeks ago and we call it Victoria Day. We're still a Commonwealth country. So happy late Victoria Day to uh, you Americans out there who have a vacation this weekend. Um, but take the time this week to, to relax and not think about work if possible. Um, but we really appreciate you being um, on these calls like I, I think it's really awesome for us to get this feedback and it really helps us to really frame our conversations on the day by day but if we're able to end a little bit early it might give you folks more time to enjoy the long weekend so thank you so much for being here um amy and i really appreciated the thoughts and so did the rest of the committee and again these conversations are ongoing so feel free to send any of us on the committee a message at any given point uh, on any platform and we're able to bring them forward and hopefully we'll be in touch regarding the, the planning teams. Absolutely, thank you so much for joining us. And I just wanna remind everybody that this presentation was recorded and that everyone who is registered will receive a link. The link will also be sent to the Open Ed Community Listserv. And uh, again, um, thanks for joining us. Thanks for your participation and um, have a great weekend. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Amy and Akanksha. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Akanksha.